And uh, we have a, a panel discussion coming up, which is a very interesting topic, entitled, Have We Reached the Tipping Point Where the Term Shared Services is a Liability That Limits What We Are Trying to Do? That's pretty heavy. So, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a veteran of the industry and a seasoned performer at Shared Services at Outsourcing Week. At various stages, she has held senior roles as a consultant and practitioner of late. She has morphed into a thought leader and agent provocateur. Is that the right way I would say? <laughs> anyway, she's a great lady and she doesn't take prisoners. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you Deborah Cops. Thank you, David. And by the way, for those of you who suffered through many, many years of uh, schoolgirl French like I did, it's agent provocateur, all right? Um, since this does look like Hogwarts, and uh, I wish I had my pointed hat on and my robe, um, let's start out this morning by talking about the topic, a tipping point. Is there, are we at the point where the term shared services really limits us? And I'm always very amused by this debate, whether it's about outsourcing or shared services, because for those of you who remember your Shakespeare, a rose by any other name would still smell as sweet. And I'm wondering whether, and our panel will help this morning, whether we really get fussed about the name shared services or business services or global business services or business support platform or whatever you want to call it. So what we're going to do this morning is explore um, through the eyes of four lady and gentlemen who together have 60 years of experience in an industry that really only thinks it's been around for 15. So I don't know quite how you do that math. Um, the term shared services, what it means to them, what it means to their organizations, and then perhaps at the end talk about the fact, are we really wasting our time thinking about renaming the baby? So, let me start out by introducing these uh, 60 years of experience. To my immediate right is Ian Mitchell. Ian, by the way, and I'd like to, you all to give him a very warm hand, this is his Outsourcing Shared Services debut. Ian, thank you, thank you for being brave <laughs> enough to join us today. Ian is with one of those American-based behemoths called Cargill. Don't run out and buy their stock because you can't. Uh, Cargill is a, is a diversified uh, agribusiness based in the great state of Minnesota, which yields uh, wrestlers for, uh, for governors. And uh, Ian is one of these guys I call a lifer. He grew up through finance, and uh, because of a great track record of performance, he now runs uh, global business services for EMEA for Cargill. Uh, to his right is uh, another debutante, Ella O'Keefe. Please give her a warm hand as well. I told Ella that this was like what I was told in high school physics. Sitting up here is as e easy as eating chocolate. So, uh, uh, morning Ella. Ella is with EMC. She is a 16-year veteran, also having come up through the uh, uh, finance ranks, and she works across uh, global finance, uh, running GBS for finance for uh, EMC. Uh, to her immediate right is Anavan Sen, who uh, is no, um, no stranger to SSON stages. Uh, Anavan was formerly the GE Global Process Improvement Leader, and he has had the job of implementing shared services, particularly in the finance arena, across the globe. He used to be tall and uh, um, blonde, but look what uh, G has done to him. So he decided to run to the dark side and is now with Chasey Partners. And last but not least is a gentleman uh, also who is no stranger to uh, stage, Michelle Dezu, who for a while would only work for companies that had CIS at the end of the name, Unisys, Infosys, Philips and now Siemens, and he is one of these people who can truly stand up and say, I run a global business services operation. So, uh, today's panel. 
Let's start out by, I'd like, uh, I'll, I'll throw this open to whoever wants to catch the ball first. How is, for each of you, how has the shared services function actually changed in the last five years? How do you define the model today in your companies as opposed to a couple of years ago? Okay, from a cargo perspective, we've had traditional financial transaction processing centers since the mid-1990s. And about two years ago, we rebranded and we called ourselves Global Business Services. And surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, nobody came knocking on our door to move extra and new work into, into GBS just because of a name change. So what we've had to spend time on in the last 12 or 15 months is really developing our brand and improving our profile and also changing our delivery model so that now I believe we can really create a compelling business case. And we're now already seeing the seeds of change and we're getting a lot of interest from business units and functions within the company to move new work into GBS. So very exciting times. Shared services, to me, it explains exactly what we do. But I really don't think it stresses positively enough the value that we can bring to an organization. So I'm open to any ideas and suggestions on, on how we change our name. So may learn something over the next couple of days. So GBS just didn't do it for Cargill, did it? Not, not straight away. Not just the name changes. Everything else that has to come with it. Yeah, if I can uh, pick it up, I mean, this, the evolutions and the changes I've seen in the past uh, more than five years, maybe 15 actually, uh, is uh, you know, this change and move from uh, transactional to expertise, from regional to global, um, and, and uh, also from uh, looking at um, uh, our services much more as solutions and services versus uh, just processes and transactions. And uh, I think it's where I'd like to see shared services evolve to, is that we're not focusing just on uh, uh, transactional and improving transactional processes, but in providing solutions uh, to the business that are relevant for them. Does GBS work in your organization? Do, do your businesses understand not only the, the delivery, but also the value that GBS brings? Uh, I would say we're currently more of a multifunctional uh, organization, uh, not truly cross-functional, if GBS means cross-functional. Uh, so we still have some uh, room uh, for, for improvement and, and for change. I think we're still in that phase where we're uh, harmonizing our processes and, uh, and uh, getting them more uh, effective, more efficient. Not yet in a stage where uh, we're taking all advantages from a GBS organization in terms of the scope of activities. We're taking advantage of it in terms of uh, support functions, uh, tools, technology, uh, so workflows, uh, case and order, uh, tools, ticketing tools that are standard across the organization in terms of quality management that's standard across, uh, but not really in terms of the solutions yet. Okay, so it is fair to say that GBS for Siemens is really a growing, expanding, an expert toolkit. Right, right. I suppose from our perspective in EMC, we started shared services back in 2005. Deborah, I recall seeing you present in Dublin, and you had mentioned about change management, and you know it was pulling the work into shared services. And I suppose our customers were in the high grass waiting to pounce. A couple of years ago, that's how we felt. Um, we've certainly evolved now and branded our value creation. And we actually have in um, global business services a lot of our internal customers knocking at our door now in EMC to take on um, new processes. We are certainly multifunction. So we've gone from just being your core traditional finance, we do pre-sales, we do HR. Um, so we've really evolved from that, that perspective. Um, we did rebrand as well, like Ian. We were GSS, we rebranded to GBS. It was very positive because I think, you know, we're more than transactional. Um, we do a lot more than that. And we've shown that we've brought revenue to our business. Um, by allowing, let's for example, in pre-sales, allowing our customers focus on their core competencies, which is selling or you know technical consulting, and we do the back office for them. 
So certainly we've evolved quite a lot in the last number of years. A lot more to come um, on our optimization of the processes. Yeah, I think, um, you know, in GE, uh, since we were the pioneers, one of the pioneers in this journey, I think it's important to understand the genesis of why it happened. Uh, you know, uh, on one side, there was a shortage of technical resources in the IT world, and people started looking eastwards, uh, more towards India, to start acquiring some of those skill sets, you know, First, to you know, start looking at the Y2K gap, etc. On the other side, you know, as GE kept growing in newer and new markets, uh, there was a need to have certain functions which were provided by corporate. So it was an expansion of certain corporate functions to allow support to these centers. Over a period of time, as as the company got scale, we started looking at options of creating a setup in India called. GE Capital International Services, which now is known as GenPact. And they started picking up work, uh, more functional work from different GE businesses. And then on the other side, GE uh, kept, uh, started outsourcing work to different uh, technology vendors. And then the entire naming and renaming started. You know, global sourcing organization, employee and financial services, global business services. But as we, you know, come, to, you know, as we come to this new decade, you know, GE realized that, you know, we have done enough of these naming, uh, and and what does it mean? You know, are we we are a part of shared services, but that kind of does not reflect to what we want to be. At the end of the day, this global business service or shared services was still largely part of the corporate organization. It still held firmly the compliance and and controllership commitment that GE had on the ground. So last couple of years back, um, GE has again started experimenting with a new concept, and, and we call it the Global Growth Organization, GGO, and we have renamed the GBS as Global Operations. What we've done is instead of having one global headquarters, we have now moved to kind of a two headquarter, one in the uh, Americas, one in the non-Americas. But we have not kept the traditional headquarter in Hong Kong. What we've done is we've divided the rest of the ex Americas market into 13 GE headquarters. And each of the 13 GE headquarters corporate function has global operations embedded into it. So that we can, uh, let's say, uh, take out the boundary walls and start getting into things which we have not conventionally gone in. I mean, we have started doing work for capital markets. We have started doing work for uh, the, the projects, you know, the, whether it's the uh, oil and gas installations, whether the energy kind of. so. That's the kind of uh, evolution we see uh, moving on from purely the transactional-based shared services to a lot more enabling function for an organization to grow. That, that brings up a good question, and Michelle and I talked about this in preparation for the meeting. What's really being shared in shared services? And if you think about what Anirvan just said, he said that, that, you, that GE is moving to a boundary, boundaryless organization when you share you have some boundaries. So I'd like to throw it out to the panel. What are you actually sharing in shared service? And it, does that, um, does it mean that there's a construct of an artificial boundary that gets in the way of the business moving on? What's shared, Michelle? Well, if I take it, uh, you know, I don't think the word sharing uh, helps uh, in any ways shared services. I think, uh, you know, it's not maybe a liability, but, but it doesn't help. Because uh, I think uh, you know our customers are happy or are ready to provide us or to ask us to, to do more, uh, not because we're shared or we're sharing something, but because we're uh, adding value to them by um, you know leverage, leveraging scale, by leveraging a global footprint. Uh, we're also by being customer focused by. Um, by, and, and I think above uh, everything by showing them that once we take a service, uh, we transform it and make it better for them. And I think that uh, focus on transformation, on providing solutions to them, uh, I think is really what um, uh, in the end they, um, uh, they remember and why they would uh, uh, come to us for new services. Yeah, I, th I think you bring about a very good point. I mean, I'm jumping in here uh, um, uh, about the whole sharing piece. You know, I think the the sharing of liability is a great example. I mean, who, where does it own? And I think uh, a lot of the 
piece started happening because it was a shared legal entity under which services were provided to different businesses, especially in GE. And probably the word came from the shared legal entity. Uh, but as we move along, uh, I think it's very important to see that it's no longer sharing, but actually a business proposition. You know, we're not just saying we share, we actually provide services, a certain kind of services, and that's the way it should be treated. I think shared services probably needs to change the name. I think with shared services, it implies to the business units or the functions that they're giving up an element of control. And I always remember very early on in my, my career in Cargill, a very senior manager pulled me aside and he said, Ian, he said, there's three things in our company that everybody's got an opinion on. And not only have they got an opinion on, but they really strongly voice their opinion. One of them was the travel policy, second one was company cars, and the third one was office services. Well, a few years on, I'd like to add a fourth one, which <coughs> is shared services. Because whoever you talk to in our organization always has an opinion on it. They have an opinion as to whether that particular activity is suitable to be shared, and if it is suitable to be shared, whether it should go to captive or BPO, and if, then if it goes to a BPO, which BPO and which country should it be in? So there's a lot of concern out there from the areas where you're moving the work from and into GBS. And the only way that I found, and I don't know what the other panelists have found, but the only way I found to overcome that is through open and regular dialogue with the areas where the work is moving from. And they, they need to be involved in that journey from the start, from the planning, through departure to arrival. And the more trips they take with, with you in the car, then the more comfortable that they will become, that they know that you know exactly where you're going and how you're going to get there, and then the less that they will want to be involved in the future. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, you know, we're, as you said, we're an internal service unit. And uh, it, it may be, uh, uh, the view of this may be a little bit different f by function or by service. Uh, so in accounting, it's less seen as, uh, as an internal service provider because it's much more rules driven and, uh, and accounting driven. But in HR, it's very much uh, uh, that way, also in customer management services and supply chain and, and so forth. And I think, uh, you know, the setup as being a service unit is, is uh, what people will like. They want to see that uh, we're responding to them, that we're uh, responding to their issues, that we understand their issues. And, um, you know, I, I try to meet with uh, the businesses within Siemens regularly and meet with CEOs of uh, regions and so forth. And uh, it's amazing the, the feedback they can give. They, they always have very strong views on us uh, having to uh, 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 bundle services much more or to look at services much more in a holistic way. I'll give one example about travel. Uh, you know, they're not interested. Travel is very complex nowadays with visa issues and rules and new statutory regulations and regulatory uh, uh, things. And we have uh, uh, many tools. We have uh, booking. We have uh, uh, business travel authorization where we check the visas and, and all rules. Uh, and then we have the, the payment system and, and uh, the claim and payment. And, and all these sit in different functions. And it's a nightmare for, for the salespeople. And, this, and plus, there are many different policies and so forth. So they're saying, look at it holistically. We want one tool. We want something easy for the people. And you know, before we were happy with our reservation system is fine. We're delivering according to SLAs. Our uh, payment claim system is fine, it is good. But overall, it doesn't make a good solution. And, and it's not a solution that people like. Uh, so, you got to think about your services. That's when I talk about solutions. You got to think about your services much more in holistic solutions than in isolation by function. Ella? Yeah, I think in the early days it's certainly shared. Um, but then, as you prove your competent at it, your ability, you meet your results and your SLAs. You own it, it's yours, and we have very little engagement then from, let's say, our customers or the business. We report out to them, um, and they know it's in safe hands. So I suppose that's what's changed. I think where the sharing is, yes, from a finance perspective, if you're at the audit meeting and you're reviewing a map, or you know, as you're providing 
um, suggestions on how to optimize the process and you know, looking at improving the intercompany process, whatever. That's where I see the sharing. But ultimately, it's um, GBS that move ahead and drive that optimization and own that and deliver it back to our customer. So shared may not be the right word. Maybe the better word is safe services. Absolutely. All right. How do you, following up on that, how do you get, how, let's look at a change management element. How have each of you gotten your businesses to share, whether it's tools or whether it's moving a process end to end, whether it's getting scale? How do you get them to all play nicely in the sandbox? Uh, I guess um, uh, first thing is uh, calling it safe is probably uh, going to be controversial because especially when we start operating in the emerging markets, you know, we start stretching ourselves uh, just to make sure that we are compliant rather than you know, more, more uh, virtues around compliance and controllership. So that's one. And playing it safe will, may not work you know, because you need to really stretch yourself. We're not saying do it anything unsafe to you which will cause you bodily harm, but being in your safe zone will not help you. So that's, that's one. Um, to, to your question, um, you know, I, I think what's, in, what's important is that one needs to look at how things are evolving. You know, uh, look at the, the way um, the businesses are, are evolving, and we need to be able to kind of align ourselves in order to take advantage of the situation of the market opportunities that come up. Any other panelists? How do you get them to share? Uh, uh, so, you know, I think it's, uh, it's exactly this. I think you really need to understand uh, what is um, uh, their issues, what are their issues, and how, with your capabilities, uh, global footprint, um, transformation capabilities, and so forth, expertise, how you can support them in a better way. But it's uh, um, really about understanding their business and making sure that you're uh, talking to them in, in a business-oriented way, not, not just, uh, you know, uh, transactions-oriented and so forth. The, um, to give one example, um, <clears throat> uh, we, we do have a small consulting unit uh, within Global Shared Services at Siemens, which is called Global Marketing Services. And uh, what they do is they help businesses um, with their uh, customer activities. So we implement net promoter score methodologies, for example. But we also do uh, things like um, identifying uh, sales leads using robots and, um, you know, on the web. So a very technical thing, but uh, that helps the businesses, um, you know, identify new leads and so forth. So it's quite important. Uh, but we got that uh, ID by engaging with this uh, marketing group and, and uh, really understand, understanding their pain points. Mm. Um, so uh, I think this closeness with the business is critical. What do you all, to, to start to create value, what's the, what's the tipping point? Is it scale? Is it a certain level of standardization? Do you have to have five out of six business units um, as customers before you can start to move up the value chain? What's that tipping point where you go from processing to creating value? I, th I think scale is important. Standardization, I'm not so sure. We lifted and shifted. 20 different accounts payable processes to our um, BPO many years ago. And then once they were in the BPO, we looked to, to streamline and harmonize them. Um, but I think the other thing that's important to remember is to make sure you've got a very robust business case. Because I know historically in Cargill, we've moved work into the shared service center. And actually, all we've done is we've increased the costs on the bottom line because we, we've had to take on resources to do the activities, but those resources that were in the business unit still remain, so the overall cost has gone up. So what we've introduced over the last 12, 18 months is a much more disciplined work intake program where both sides commit to it. So the area where the work is moving from, they commit to these are the savings that they're going to achieve, and then from a GBS perspective, we say what it's going to cost us to provide the service net net should be a saving to the company and then once we've completed the transition we will sit down say 12 months later with the senior leadership team with both sides and we have to go through and demonstrate that 
where the money is, where, where the work has moved from, that they've kept to their side of the bargain, and where it's moved to GBS, we've kept to our side as well. So scale, business case, what else do you need to be able to start to really create a different level of value for your organizations? Uh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, scale is important. I think that comes in the first phase with uh, you know the, the, ma the main cost savings. Well, it's got to be followed very, very quickly by transformation capabilities, and uh, and I think overall, you know, uh, transformation capabilities and uh, uh, global delivery footprint to to deliver scale. Uh, you you got to have an organization that's very uh, professional um, in terms of uh, KPIs, quality, and so forth, and I think service-minded. Yeah, I have a different, different opinion. Um, I, th I think, you know, I'm a firm believer that when things evolve, when there's an evolution, there's also an element of inertia that sets in. Uh, and, and purely to have a tipping point, just to keep evolving, does not necessarily put you or bring you to that tipping point, you know. Evolution needs to be disrupted every, uh, on a, almost like a regular basis with new events, um, you know, without which there won't be innovation. There won't be things, uh, you know, those wild swings. And which is why, alludes back to the point that I make, in this world there are two kinds of players, safe players and people who will start pioneering things. Uh, and that, therefore, for me, the tipping point essentially is more the market reality. Because at the end of the day, we are, uh, tend to be a, a shared services function, a back office function, a global operation function, whatever you call it. But the market reality uh, are changing constantly, and therefore there has to be some sort of disruption that needs to take place in order for us to start looking at. Because it, let's say in, in GE, I mean, we tried the nice ways of getting businesses on board for 20 years. Not everybody got on board, and that's when we had to change because because of not everybody was getting on board, and even this was both carrot and stick approach, it didn't work. It was time for GE to relook at the market conditions, things that changed in the last 20 years, being America-centric, we had become truly global. And that's where we needed to redefine the way the shared services started working, and, and the GE decided to take a big swing. Yeah, I, I would say scale is key, Deborah, particularly, you know, as volumes increase, as we take more market share, um, you know, the business needs to scale and I suppose budgets are tight, so they look at GBS as a very viable option. Um, I think earlier in the question, marketing and your branding is key and, and similar in EMC in our PMO, we have a branding and marketing organization to share some of the successes. You know, it's not, we've just taken a process in and streamlined it, we've, we've done a lot more than that. Um, so for us, it, it's certainly scale. scale. Can, can I just pick up on one thing that um, Ella mentioned about budget? Because I, I don't know, but probably like many of you in the audience, I have to recover my cost by charging out my services to the business that I provide those services to. And the idea is that I should break even so I shouldn't make a profit or a loss. But actually what I'm finding, I really want to invest in my capabilities and capacities to grow GBS. But the conundrum is I can't do that because it costs money and I'm getting a lot of pushback from the businesses to increase the allocation to the businesses. So the whole funding of how we support GBS is a big question for us in the company at the moment that I, I don't know what the solution is, don't know what other people do, but we're, we're in discussions with our senior leadership team about whether we can change our funding model. We have a very similar model as well, and I suppose we would like to hold on to some of those savings and reinvest them rather than constantly sending back um, cost efficiencies and reductions to our customers. So uh, very similar, Ian, um, with EMC, and I'm sure a lot of um, the people here today. Very quickly, I think we're probably running a little short on time. If you were going to rename what you do, Michelle, what would you call it? Uh, probably uh, something around business solutions. I think uh, I'd like uh, you know, to be able to say at some point in time uh, with Siemens, Siemens that I'm uh, uh, providing uh, solutions that make people's lives easier and more efficient within Siemens. Um, so it will be around solutions. So, uh, so the, initials yet, are, no? the initials are BS, yes. 
Yeah, it will be BS, okay. probably. All right, <laughs> BS, I, yes. I couldn't resist. I quite, couldn't frankly, uh, <laughs> quite frankly, it's not been a topic, really. We, co we call it GSS. Nobody knows what GSS means, so you know the word shared and so forth uh, is not really a, a big issue right now. It but, sounds uh, either like a uh, pharmaceutical company or a, um, or a secret police. <laughs> Which one are you? Uh, Anurvan, what would you rename? You know, um, whatever I rename, it's going to change again in the next two to three years. Okay. So well, we, can you stick to something right now? Yeah. How about from you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know uh, again, uh, you know, having been with G, you know, kind of s stick around global operations because I think that kind of accentuates where the shared services is evolving to. Ella, you can name it anything you want. Yeah, I think with the shared services naming, people think, oh, I can get two for the price of one, and that's what they think of when they think of shared services. Um, I like probably to call it something like delivery centers of expertise. And Ian? Um, I like all three, so I'm going to have to get the <laughs> coin out and toss the coin. <laughs> but uh, I think whatever we call ourselves, the important thing for me is, is to remember that if we do our job and we do it really, really well, then the important thing from the businesses that we provide their services to is, is that they can really focus 100% on what's important for our company, and that's our external customer. Well, that reminds me of a, of my, my, of a story, my, of my, uh, something my father used to say, you can call me anything you want, but just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> so, uh, on that note, uh, Naomi, do we have time for a few questions for the panel? questions. If you've got a question, just raise your hand. Um, we've got coming around. No questions? Yeah, people need their coffee, you know, okay. just to wake Thank up. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you for being a great you. audience. Thank you.